It's a, it's a real pleasure and honor to begin this school and to be asked to, to do so and to be with all of you today. It's your remarkable group of people. I hope over the next two days to get to know some of you a little better. Um, we'll talk about big things and small things uh, in the next two days, all of them big in a way. Uh, we are going to begin with the, with the really big, which is the universe today. And um, I was trying to think of how to do these two lectures. So the first one is going to completely overwhelm you. Um, I understand the students from China just arrived this morning, so if, if, um, if your head is spinning, I'm sorry. Uh, but, uh, and then tomorrow we'll ease up a little bit and then just talk about the fundamental structure of matter, much, much easier subject. But I want to talk about the universe today. And, and I've included some, some things that I hope um, that I wouldn't normally talk to a, a, a general audience or even many student audiences about it, but I understand you're all hot shots. So, um, so we'll try that. Now, this is a new word. You might not have seen this word, Christatunities, but I want to, I'll play, um, I'll begin to, to clarify what I mean here. I don't know if, the, if this is true, what, what you're about to see, in the sense of um, whether the claim is true. Um, for the Chinese students can tell me later if it's true, but let's see. I hope the sound works. Here we go. Did you know that the Chinese use the same word for crisis as they do for opportunity? Yes, Christatunity. Okay. Said that I, put, I turned the sound down earlier, I should have turned it up. But it said, you know, do you know this Chinese, I don't know if it's true, use the same word as for crisis as they do for opportunity. And Homer said, crisitunity. And, um, but in a sense, that's true about science. Whenever science is in one way or another in crisis, in the sense that there are things that just don't make sense, that's an incredible opportunity. And I want to talk about that in the context of cosmology today. I want to talk about the, the revolutions that have taken place in understanding of the universe uh, over the last 50 years that have changed things more than I ever thought would have been possible when I was your age. And some of the opportunities that are, that are there, and hopefully you will be the generation to take advantage of those opportunities and take us forward. So I'm gonna, I'm, I began with that quote from Louise Bogan about the initial, most part of any mystery is, to, is how the traveler got to his starting point in the first place. And that's the point. I want to bring you to the starting point that where we're at right now, the things we've learned and the puzzles and things we don't understand, and hopefully uh, doing that inspires some of you to uh, take us to the next step. And I hope some of you will. So uh, this is a Hubble telescope image. I love all Hubble space telescope images. They all inspire me in different ways. This is a continually interesting one. It's a deep space image. Um, uh, uh, it's, it's one of the deepest images the uh, Hubble Space Telescope has taken. It's also a recent version because it's actually a multicolor, multichromatic image. So the colors in this are relatively real, yeah, and, uh, blue, ye yellow, etc. And uh, so it's taken with many different filters. And that allows you to look at galaxies at different ages. The bluer galaxies are the oldest ones, the bluest, faintest galaxies. The interesting thing about this image is every, except for this, which is a star, every other dot in this image is a galaxy, not a star. There are 100 billion galaxies in the observable universe, at least, each of them containing 100 billion stars. And the, the, the oldest galaxies in this image, the blue galaxies, are probably around 9 billion light years away. That means the light took 9 billion years to get to us, which is interesting to me because, of course, our sun is only about four and a half billion years old, and, and many main sequence stars live nine or ten billion years. Our sun will live ten billion years before it burns out and eats up the earth in the process. But that means when you look at this, many of the stars in this image, in fact, most of the stars in this image, are no longer stars. They've long ago burned out, and any civilizations that may have been around those stars are long dead. And just, if they took a picture of us, uh, then the light for, from us would arrive there nine billion years from now, well after we're gone, well after the Earth is toast. And whether or not our civilization survives beyond the lifetime of the sun um, is an open question. And it, it depend, for me, it depends on the day, whether I'm optimistic or pessimistic about whether that may be possible. But if it's going to happen, it's going to depend on people like you to help make our global society more sensible, rational, and focus on global problems which the 21st century is dealing with uh, in a way we've never had to deal with before. But in any case, that's, that's, when we look at that, there's, it not only inspires me to think about all those long dead civilizations, but the fact that there are so many galaxies and where ours is just one in a random place in the middle of nowhere. And the other thing that's interesting about this image is that it turns out if you looked anywhere in the, anywhere in the universe, you'd see the, more or less the same picture. The universe is the same in all directions. 
And that's a mystery, in fact, a mystery we may have solved, but you may wonder why it's a mystery, but it turns out that, that as you'll see, there's no real reason that you would expect in the standard Big Bang picture for the universe to look the same over there as there, but it does to incredibly high accuracy, as we'll see. So let's, let's begin and take you back um, to really the basis of modern cosmology, which is an observation in 1929. But, oh yeah, before I do this, what I want to emphasize in these two lectures, and you'll see it pretty soon, has to do with this image, which is one of my favorite. It's, this image goes back in different civilizations about 4,000 years. It's called an Ouroboros, normally a snake that eats its own tail, but in this particular snake has legs, but maybe that's an evolutionary issue. Um, but uh, it's, a, it's a famous concept throughout many different civilizations, going back to ancient Egypt at least. And in some sense, it's a particularly appropriate for our universe, because as you'll see, when we start thinking about our universe, we start thinking about scales, we start at human scales, and then go to bigger scales, planets, and then, and then galaxies, and then clusters of galaxies, and then the entire universe itself. It turns out, in order to understand the biggest scales we can see, and how they evolved, we eventually have to come right back to understand the very smallest structures that, that exist. And the reason for that is that the universe is expanding. And because it's expanding, it was once smaller, and in fact, 13.8 billion years ago, the entire visible universe containing all of the matter that is now contained in 100 billion galaxies, each containing 100 billion stars, was contained in a region the size of a single atom. It's hard to imagine compressing all that material. It's hard to imagine you can talk about that with a straight face, but we can, and people like me get paid to think about that. And because of that, if we want to understand the biggest structures we can see, ultimately we have to understand the origin of the universe, and that's when the entire universe was microscopic in size, and that means we have to understand the fundamental laws and, uh, of physics at microscopic scales, which is why, by the way, my training is in particle physics. That's why I got interested in cosmology in the first place, because the universe is a wonderful experiment. It was done once, at least and now it's just data analysis, but it will allow us to probe physics on a scale that we probably, as you'll see, will never be able to directly probe with accelerators here on Earth. So I'm going to begin with, as I say, talking about the universe today. By the way, tomorrow I'm going to, I'm going to move into particle physics and talk about how some of these ideas relate to things that we, in fact, we'll see at the Large Hadron Collider. Okay, so the guy who's changed everything is this guy from 1929, um, uh, Edwin Hubble who um, is, a, is a hero of mine because he, um, he began life as a lawyer and then became an astronomer. So there's hope for everybody, including maybe some, <laughs> including some of the VIPs here. My hope is that none of you, you students will go to the dark side early on, but maybe. Um, Hubble did many things, and, and in fact, he was the first one to really demonstrate the existence of other galaxies. Until 1925, we only knew of one galaxy. Ours, the Milky Way. The universe consisted of a single galaxy, our Milky Way, surrounded by what was thought to be a vast, eternal, empty space, and static and eternal. There was no evidence of anything else. That was the conventional scientific wisdom. He changed all that with a series of observations that culminated in a, in, a, in a publication in 1929. What he saw, and this is a physics lecture, not a biology lecture, though, so these are they're galaxies, not sperm. But, but, uh, these are, schematically, if this is our galaxy, what he discovered was remarkable. That if you look at other galaxies, on average, they're moving away from us. They're all moving away from us on average. And moreover, there's a remarkable relationship. Those that are twice as far away are moving twice as fast away from us. Those that are three times as far away are moving three times as fast, etc. Now, when you look at this, and most people do, when you look at this and are told this, and this is codified, by the way, and this is a group I can actually show equations to, so I'm going to show you some equations. But this is codified by the fact that the velocity is proportional to distance, and the constant of proportionality we call the Hubble constant after Mr. Hubble. The number doesn't matter so much here. But that's what he discovered. Now, when you look at that, it, the immediate conclusion you draw is that we are the center of the universe, right? Everything is moving away from us, so we must be the center. And however, although many, many of you probably feel that way right now, it's not true. And so the question is, how can we see that this doesn't tell us we're at the center of the universe? Well, the, our problem is one of myopia, and one of the great things about science, which was alluded to twice today in, in different ways, is to take you out of your myopic preconceptions about what reality is or what it should be. 
The universe forces us to constantly reassess what we think is sensible and what's normal. So we're, we're myopic because we're sitting in our galaxy. So we'd have a much better view of the universe if we could sit outside the universe. Very few people are doing that right now. Um, uh, most people are contained in our universe. In my country, probably the Republican Party isn't. But, but, uh, <laughs> the, the, um, but what I want to do is, draw, is take, take a universe that um, I can make myself outside and we can stand outside of it. So this is a two-dimensional universe one with, where I put the galaxies on regular, a regular lattice at equal distances, and you can see if you're standing outside this universe that at time one, the universe is smaller than it is at time two. So if you were standing outside the universe, you'd say well, this universe is expanding uniformly. But what would you see if you were on a given galaxy? Take, say, that one right there. Well, to see, all I have to do is superimpose this image on top of this one, placing that galaxy on top of itself, and what you see is exactly what Hubble saw. Every galaxy is moving away from you, those that are twice as far away have moved twice the distance in the same time. Those that are three times as far away have moved three times the distance, and so on. And it doesn't matter what galaxy you pick. Everywhere you see exactly the same thing. I think I have to get over here. So if I do that with that galaxy, I see exactly the same thing. So what Hubble's, Hubble's discovery tells us is that the universe is expanding uniformly. And it, and it depends on whether you're sort of an optimist or a pessimist or your viewpoint, it's just semantics. Either every place is the center of the universe or no place is the center of the universe. It's words. It doesn't really matter. What's happening is that the universe is expanding uniformly. And that was a remarkable observation, and it's so important we should ask, you know, why do we trust it? And the answer is that, well, if you're going to measure velocity as a function of distance, then if you're a scientist, you have to measure velocity and distance. Okay? Now, how can we measure the velocity of, of objects? Well, we use, we use a principle that these two guys, I, I live in Arizona some of the time, and, and these guys are on the plane in Arizona, and they're looking at this train, and one of them says to the other, I love hearing that lonesome wail of the train whistle as the magnitude of the frequency of the wave changes due to the Doppler effect. <laughs> and many of you know about the Doppler effect, but to remind those of you who don't, Okay, a train whistle sounds higher when it's moving towards you and lower when it's moving away because the sound waves get scrunched up in front of the train, basically, and stretched behind the train. So the wavelength increases behind the train, the frequency goes down the opposite direction in front. It turns out for different reasons in relativity, the same thing happens for light. Light emitted from objects that are moving away is stretched in wavelength, light emitted towards us in objects moving towards us is, is compressed. And we use that, so here's, here's a... Here's a star and emits light in a, in, a, in, a, in a set of frequencies characteristic of the elements that make up the star. This was a very important discovery in science back in the 18th century. That there's a certain set of frequencies, a spectrum that's emitted by star, light from stars. Primarily, it's the same set of frequencies that we would measure in hydrogen in the laboratory if you heat it up, telling us profoundly that stars are mostly made of hydrogen, which was a big discovery because it meant that star stuff and Earth stuff was the same, that the stuff that made up the stars and the stuff we found here on Earth was the same, which of course was not known in that time. And by the way, as an aside, it's one of the reasons we know the laws of physics are the same everywhere. People often, you know, ask me if that's the case, and some people assert it isn't, and some people say we take it on faith. We don't take anything on faith in science. If you can't test it, you should be skeptical. And it was an initial assumption to simplify the, our thinking of the universe, that it was the same everywhere, but we can test it. We can test it because we can look at the spectrum of light coming from distant galaxies in all directions. And that spectrum is, is identical, telling us the laws of quantum mechanics and electromagnetism. And everything in the 20th century that allowed us to understand the spectra of atoms is precisely the same in those different stars, for the most part, to high accuracy. We continue to test that. And in fact, there are places here in Australia where they're testing it and claiming to see some slight differences, although that at a level that we, we really, uh, most people are quite skeptical of. But in any case, so we can see that, spe that spectrum, but if the star is moving away from us, that all those spectral lines are shifted to the long wavelength end of the visible spectrum, which is the red end, and if they're, it's moving towards us to the blue end. And so we say what Hubble discovered was a redshift, that galaxies are redshifting. And now we can measure directly the velocity of galaxies by seeing how much the light is shifted. And those galaxies that are further away have the light shifted more to the red end of the spectrum. So if the velocity is the easy part of Hubble's law. How do you measure distance? That's a challenge. Because we don't have tape measures that are that long. 
And the question is, how do you measure the distance to distant galaxies? And, of course, he used physics. And conventional mechanisms don't work. We, we can use parallax to measure. I can, I can measure the distance to the back of the room by opening one eye and closing the other and seeing how much you move. And you've probably maybe done that in high school physics class. But we have to use another technique. And the technique is to say, well, look, I could determine the distance to the back of the room where those, those uh, lights showing the, the two two uh, images are. Let's say there's a 500 watt light bulb in, that, in those projectors and I took out the lenses so the light went out uniformly in all directions. Now we know that light falls off, the intensity falls off as 1 over r squared, 1 over the area. And so if I had a light meter here and I could ask how much power was being received by this light meter and I knew it was a 500 watt light bulb, I could do the calculation as could you to determine how far away it was. The further away I wa it was, the less power that would be coming into my meter. Okay, so all we need, to, it would be wonderful if in the universe there were 500 watt light bulbs scattered throughout the universe so that we could use it to test distance, but we can't. So we have to look for the equivalent, something we call a standard candle. Something whose inherent brightness we believe we understand, and then we look at the telescope to look at it and see how bright it looks, and then we can tell how far away it is. Okay? And by the way, I should have said at the very beginning that, um, that I know that this, since this is the first lecture, I'll be surprised, but you can surprise me, and I like to be surprised if people actually raise their hands during the lecture. But you're, please f be welcome to do that. If there's something I say that at the moment puzzles you, feel free to ask a question then, okay? And w w there'll be time for questions at the end. This lecture is only going to go on for four or five hours, and so we'll have lots of time for, for, for questions. Or it may just seem that way. Anyway... So this was Hubble's original data from 1929. This is velocity versus distance. And this is why he was such a great scientist, because he knew to draw a straight line through that data set, which is not at all obvious. And he did that, and he, and he determined this Hubble constant, a number. And the interesting thing is he got it wrong by a factor of 10, which has uh, been important in the history of science. I mean, astrophysicists try and emulate that nowadays. Um, but more importantly, it was a real crisis because he determined the universe is expanding 10 times faster than it actually is, almost. And if you work it out, if you can work backwards and say if it's moving 10 times faster, the age of the universe would actually be 10 times younger. So if his result was right, the age of the universe would only be 1.5 billion years. This was 1929. And even then, they knew, except in certain states in my country, and and, and perhaps Queensland in Australia, um, uh, the, um, that, that, uh, that the Earth is, is, is much older than that. Uh, the Earth is four and a half billion years old, and it's embarrassing when the Earth is older than the universe. Um, so, so, but that was good news is he got it wrong. It was a testable thing. It could have said there's something wrong with our picture, but in fact, he got it wrong. Now, he did, didn't get it wrong because he was a, a bad astronomer. He was a very good astronomer. He, he didn't have good standard candles. And so the search in the 20th century to try and measure the expansion rate of the universe and then therefore determine its major features, which was really the holy grail of, of cosmology in much of the 20th century, was really the search for better standard candles. And it culminated in the 1990s with a, with a really good kind of standard candle. This is a, a galaxy far, far away, long, long ago. Actually, it's not that far away. It's only 74 million light years away. So the light takes 74 million years to get to us. It's a spiral galaxy, much like our own. Once you've seen one, you've seen them all. My apologies to the observational astronomers here. But, but you know, there, if this were our galaxy, we'd be living here in a boring suburb, not Sydney, but where the sun is. And um, this, this, what you, interesting thing is that you see this whole, this 100 billion stars, the center of the galaxy maybe has 10 billion stars. And here is a star that appears to have the brightness of the center of the galaxy, the brightness of 10 billion stars. How could this be? Well, the simplest assumption is that it's really a star in our galaxy that got in the way of the picture. That's the first thing you could assume. And it's a good assumption, except it's wrong. It's a, it's a star that's on the edge of that galaxy. And it is burning with the brightness of 10 billion stars. How could that be? It's a star that's just exploded. A supernova explosion. And supernovae are the brightest fireworks in the universe. When a star explodes, it burns with a brightness of 10 billion stars for a while, for a month or so. And it, it's, it's fortunate for us that stars don't explode more often. Um, 
for us, for our survival. But it's actually fortunate for us that they explode. If they didn't, none of us would be here. Because all, essentially all of the atoms in your body have experienced such an explosion at least once and more likely four or five or ten times. Because in the Big Bang, the only elements that were uh, created, if you wish, uh, were, uh, of initially protons and neutrons were hydrogen, proton, helium, the next lightest element, and, and a little bit of lithium. But all of the elements that are important for your survival, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, iron, all of the things that really are relevant to this room were not created in the Big Bang. They were created in the fiery cores of stars. And the only way it could get into your body, all those elements, was if the star was kind enough to explode and spew out those elements. So every atom in your body, in the left hand, they may have come from different stars in the right hand. You are literally stardust. You are children of the stars. We all are. And so this, it, this whole discussion of what we're talking about when we talk about the origin of the universe is really the origin of ourselves. It's really intimate. You are the cosmos. So that's an aside, but I wanted to point it out because to me it's one of the most poetic things I know about all of science. And, and, and I learned it when I was younger and I carried it with me and maybe you will. But it turns out that these kind of exploding stars are really good standard candles. Now, the problem is stars explode about once per 100 years per galaxy. So if you want to use them to study the universe, uh, that's a problem. So how, how do you study these things? Well, you could assign a graduate student to each galaxy. 100 years is about the right time for a PhD, as it will seem to you if some of you go on and do PhDs. And, um, uh, but, and it would work, and graduate students are very cheap. And if you die, you get a new one. It's, if they die, you get a new one. It's kind of easy. But we don't need to do that, because the universe is very big and very old, and rare events happen all the time. In fact, tonight, in Sydney, it won't be too easy. It's kind of bright, but if you take a, a size of a, a $2 Australian coin and hold it up in, in, in the sky, and look in the part of the sky where there are no stars, where it's completely dark. With the largest telescopes on Earth we have now, in Chile and other places, in that region, you could see about 100,000 galaxies. Just in that small region. And that means if you work it out, once per 100 years per galaxy, if there are 100,000 galaxies, on a given night in that region, you should see a few stars explode. And astronomers actually do that. They apply for telescope time, and they say, tonight we're going to see three or four stars explode, and it, maybe it's cloudy, and they don't see any, or maybe they see one, maybe they see five. But that, we can actually use that to study these objects. And in fact, we can use that to see them. And so here's a movie of a given star exploding in that galaxy. It'll repeat. And we can use this to study these supernovae called type 1a supernovae. We can measure its brightness and its colors. Its colors tell us what type of exploding star it is. And this was used in the 1990s to allow us, because supernovae are so bright, we can use them to see galaxies on the other end of the vis visible universe. And if we know their intrinsic brightness, we can see how far away they are by looking at a telescope and seeing how bright they appear. And then we know how far away the galaxy they're in is. And we can measure the expansion rate of the universe. And this was done. Um, improved, so I think I have an improved version of the Hubble plot in the 1990s. This is done after the incredibly important mathematical discovery that on a log-log plot, everything is a straight line. But um, even without that guide to the eye, we now know the Hubble constant not to within a factor of 10 uncertainty, but to within a few percent uncertainty. And that's allowed people to make some discoveries that were never thought possible. In fact, the people who use these techniques to try and measure the Hubble constant better, we're quite surprised. And of course, um, there's a big Australian content in that, as I'll get to. But once, once we know that the universe is expanding, the big question, and it was the question that, that fascinated me when I was your age, and one of the reasons I went into the kind of physics I went into was I wanted to be the first person to know how the universe would end. It seemed like a good idea at the time. And it turns out, you'll see that it, my ideas were quite misplaced, but it turns out that the answer to that question is the same as the answer to a question in an introductory physics class. If I had the coin, oh, I do have a coin. Okay, so we teach you, you've all been through this, but we teach you, if you throw a coin up and it comes back down, if you throw it up faster, it takes longer to come back down. If I threw it up really fast and there were no ceilings here, it would escape the earth. And as all of you undoubtedly know, we've fig we, we turned this into bookkeeping in physics, okay? We write down the total energy of the coin, gravitational energy to be its kinetic energy, the positive piece, 
and the, and the negative piece, the gravitational potential energy from the Earth. And then we just turn it into a bookkeeping problem. We look at those two energies, the one positive, one negative, and we say, well, if the total energy is greater than zero, the coin will escape. If the total energy is less than zero, the coin will return. It was, it's simple. So it's just bookkeeping. So we add up the total energy. And by the way, when we set them equal, exactly equal, we get the total gravitational energy zero. That's the escape velocity from the Earth. So we set, we set that term equal to that term. That determines the escape velocity of the Earth, which you understand, see the masses cancel out, and we get a velocity of 11 kilometers per second. And that's how we determine, that's how we give NASA the information of what they need to know to how fast to send a rocket ship up if it's going to escape from the Earth. It's just bookkeeping. Okay. Well, we can do the same for the universe. Here's a, here's a picture of, uh, say, Hubble's picture of, of and here's a galaxy and, and a bunch of galaxies nearby. And if the universe is the same everywhere, as I just told you it is, then what happens to every galaxy will happen to any galaxy or vice versa. So if we want to find out if, if the universe is going to expand forever, all we have to do is look at a single galaxy and ask, is it going to continue to move away from us forever or is it going to stop and come back? And then, if, as long as this region is small compared to the size of the universe, so effects of relativity are not important, we can just do the Newtonian calculation that you've all done in high school. We can say, okay, let's ask what the total gravitational energy of that galaxy is. The positive piece it's its kinetic energy, it's its velocity. But that, Mr. Hubble told us that. Because you measure the distance, you know it's velocity. So the velocity squared is proportional to the Hubble constant squared. The negative piece is all the mass within the sphere centered on us, if we're asking where if it's going to escape from us. And, and that's the total mass within that sphere, which depends on the density of material. So all we have to do is compare those two things. If it's a homework assignment tonight. Get a telescope, go out and measure the Hubble constant in the first part of the evening. And then the second part of the evening, determine the density of matter in our near, nearby region of the, of the universe. And then compare the two. And, it, and if B over A is bigger than 1, if this term is bigger than that term, then this object, you'd think, would just collapse, just like a coin will come back. If B over A is less than 1, so the positive piece beats the negative piece, it'll expand forever. So really, the, 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 the holy grail, as I say, of cosmology was to measure over the course of the 20th century these two pieces. One of the reasons we needed to hold the Hubble constant is to get that piece better. And then, of course, the hard part is measuring the total mass density of the universe, as I'll talk about. But I would leave it here if, it weren't for, if this were a, a, a normal group, but you're not a normal group. So if you don't mind, I'm going to teach you general relativity in the next two minutes. Okay? <laughs> we're going to derive Einstein's equations for an expanding universe. You can write your friends back home at the end of this in the next two minutes. Okay? It's really quite simple. Okay, so let's, that's the picture I gave earlier, and I said, you know, let's consider a galaxy of mass m at the edge of a region of radius r. What's its total energy? Well, let's actually do the equation. There it is. Okay, its total gravitational energy is a half mv squared minus gm m over r. Now, all we care about is whether this is positive or negative. We don't care about how big it is. We just care about its sign, right? Okay, everyone's taking notes now. I like that. Okay as long as you listen. So, all I, can, I can make it simpler. I can multiply both sides. As long as I multiply both sides by positive numbers, I'm not changing anything. So I multiply both sides by 2 and divide by m. m is a positive number. And I still get, I, if this term is positive, then this galaxy has total positive energy. If it's negative, it has total negative energy. And so I compare it. It's just velocity squared minus 2gm over r. Well, OK. But let's, we can plug in. Because Einstein, or Hubble tells us what the velocity is of a galaxy at a given distance. Velocity is proportional to distance, and the constant of proportionality is h. So I can write velocity squared as h squared r squared. Okay? If v equals hr, v squared is equal to h squared r squared. Now, what's the total mass in a sphere of radius r? Well, what's the volume of a sphere? Anybody? Your hot shots. Don't be afraid. What's the volume of a sphere? Of radius r. Let's just... A squared. Okay, I'm so happy someone had the bravery to shout that out. Okay. You all knew it, but you were all afraid because just in case you got... Anyway. Four-thirds pi r squared. I, okay. And then, so the mass within a, a radius r is four-thirds pi r squared, the volume, times the average density. 
Okay, you're all with me? Nothing mystical so far? So now I just want to make it simpler. So um, I want to multiply and divide by other positive quantities. Well, r squared is a positive quantity, so I can divide by it. And I get this quantity. Okay. This quantity, which determines the total energy of the universe times some factors, or total energy of that galaxy, I should say, is h squared, the Hubble constant, minus 8 pi g3 over rho. Well, let me just call all of these constants uh, here, the 2 e total m, give it a name, call it minus kappa. We'll call it 2 over m e total minus kappa. Minus kappa over r squared, this constant, some number, related to the total energy of that galaxy, is h squared minus 8 pi g over 3 rho. This is Einstein's equations for an expanding universe. You have now derived it with all the factors of pi and 3. This is the equation that determines the evolution of the universe. But what we call this quantity kappa in general relativity is the curvature of the universe. So in general relativity, we derive this equation in a little bit different way, and we derive an equation that tells us how the universe is going to expand, and it depends on the curvature of the universe. But now you see the physical meaning of curvature. We call this minus kappa. So if the total energy of this galaxy is positive, then kappa is negative. We call that an open universe. If the, total, if, if the total energy is negative, so that this object will collapse again, then kappa is positive. We call that a closed universe. And if the total energy is precisely zero, so kappa is zero, just the amount of energy you would need if you had a coin throwing it up to escape and not move at the end, we call that a flat universe. And so this is literally, with all the factors of pi and 3, Einstein's equation for an expanding universe, and the problem is just to determine kappa, the curvature of the universe. And so we can draw pictures, but of course it's hard to draw pictures of curved three-dimensional universes because we're three-dimensional beings, and therefore we can't really picture three curved three-dimensional surfaces. But we can all picture curved two-dimensional surfaces, so as a guide to the eye only, I draw you, it turns out the geometry is the same in three dimensions as two dimensions. There are three possibilities. Here's a two-dimensional closed surface, the surface of a sphere. A two-dimensional open surface, an infinite uh, saddle-like structure. And a two-dimensional flat surface, an infinite piece of paper, flat piece of paper. And the business of cosmology was to determine what is the curvature of the universe, which are in the universe do you live in, and that, of course, depended upon those quantities, the expansion rate and the density. And what is interesting is, if matter is all there is in the universe, then if we live in a closed universe, equations in general relativity tell us the universe will expand, stop, and eventually we collapse. If we live in an open universe, it'll expand forever. And if we live in a flat universe, it'll expand and slow down and stop, if matter is all there is. Why? Because in a flat universe, the total gravitational energy of every object is zero. So the positive and negative piece balance exactly. It's like throwing up a coin. It'll asymptotically escape, but never at infinity, it'll have zero velocity. Whereas if we live in an open universe, the total gravitational energy is positive, And just like a coin, it'll keep going forever. And a closed universe, it's negative. So all of this fancy geometry that sounds so good at cocktail parties and everything else is just first-year physics. And the question is to determine the total energy of every object in the universe. And that comes from the determining the density of the universe for the following reason. Let me write that wonderful Einstein's equation down again. And look at one particular value, zero a flat universe. Well, it's zero when this term exactly equals that term. When that term equals that term, this is the expansion rate of the universe, this is the density. So when the density of the universe is some critical density, we call it, it's a flat universe. If the density is less than the critical density, the universe is open. If the density is greater than some critical density, the universe is closed. And so we, we codify that by asking what the actual density of the universe is over the critical density, and we call that quantity omega. We call it omega because we want to sound scholarly, and whenever physicists have an important quantity, they give it a Greek letter to make it sound, sound fancy and confuse others. And so the business of 20th century cosmology was to measure omega, to determine the density of the universe. And in the next few minutes, I want to talk to you about how we've done it. We began by standing on the shoulders of giants. Again, I want to, I, one of the purposes of my talk today is to show you that you are empowered in ways that maybe you didn't think you were. One of the problems of the ways we teach physics is, is that we teach 
the way we teach it is, is make it sound like it was all done 200 years ago by dead white men, which is not true. It's a very live discipline. And it, in fact, the very concepts that you've learned in high school already empower you to take quantitatively, not just qualitatively, quantitatively, to understand puzzles and issues at the very forefront of physics. All of modern physics is based on those concepts you now know. And therefore, you already have the power to literally begin to work at the forefront of physics, even with just high school physics. So don't despair if, it seems, if sliding balls down inclined planes seems boring, which it is, in my opinion. Um, and, uh, that it, it, you know, there, this too shall pass. And what you're learning now is actually useful. So anyway, I want to show you that. So this is, we're going to weigh the universe. We go back to this guy here. Do any of you know who this is? What was that? Hey, very good. Did you must have very good eyes because if you notice, he's missing the tip of his nose. And um, and Tycho Brahe, Tycho Brahe, which is really the right way to say it, was a um, um, a, a Danish astronomer who was um, who uh, actually saw a supernova in our galaxy, one of the last supernovas in our galaxy. And the emperor of Denmark liked him so much, he gave him an island, and all the serfs on that island. In those days, it was good to be a scientist, um, and uh, if you were lucky. Uh, and he and what Brahe did was establish an observatory on that island, on the island of Venn. I've been there. I took this picture myself, actually, on that island. And interestingly enough, the observatory was underground. I won't, you know, again, I would, this, a normal audience, I wouldn't ask any of Any of you have an idea why the observatory is underground? Maybe we'll try and get some interaction. Yes? It was what? Well, that's a good, that's a really good answer. It's not right, but it's a really good answer. Um, if you're far enough underground, you get rid of the lights from cities, but you don't have to worry about the lights because this was an island and there were only, you know, some uh, surfs on it who, were, who didn't have lights. And um, it's, it's actually a really complicated issue. I never would have realized it myself, but I, but I wanted you to think about it. It turns out this observatory was made before the invention of the telescope, which is an important bit clue that I didn't give you. So actually, oh, you think you know the answer then? Yeah? Well, it's, again, good question, but all of you are overthinking the problem, okay? It's really much simpler. The way he met did a, a, astronomy was he just had the measuring devices with crosshairs. To and his, his goal was to find the position of the planets on the sky each night. And the reason it was underground is there was wind. <laughs> so he put the crosshairs underground so they wouldn't shake, that's all. <laughs> okay. And... But it's important to realize that because he was in a single set of observations over 20 years. That's all he did was measure the positions of the planets every night. That's it. He was able to improve our ability to measure the positions of planets in the sky by a factor of 10 compared to anyone before, including the Babylonian astronomers and people who had spent their whole lives doing this. And this was really important because then he got, he was a crummy feudal lord and the emperor of, of Denmark changed, so they got, kicked him off the island. He went to Prague we found an unfortunate kind of hapless young man who he took on as his, his assistant, a guy named Johannes Kepler. And he did what we all do to our assistants. He gave him the data and said, figure it out. And so Kepler spent 20 years without a Mac or anything, or worse, a PC, um, uh, trying to figure it out. And of course, as you probably know, came up with Kepler's laws. He used Tycho's information to come up with tech, Kepler's laws. And ultimately... What Kepler's law has come down to is a recognition that, as you may have heard, again, it may have seemed boring and something you have to remember, but that the square of the velocity of planets from the sun is inversely proportional to their distance from the sun. Velocity squared falls off as 1 over r. So velocity falls off as 1 over the square root of r. So I went to an undergraduate astronomy textbook, and I, I just took the data, and I compared it to a 1 over square root of r curve, and I would have fudged the data if I had to, but I didn't. It's an incredibly good fit. Now, what's important is that Newton became Newton because of this. Because Newton showed... So what, what Kepler showed is this, that the velocity squared is proportional to 1 over r. But what made Newton rich and famous is that he, literally rich and famous, is that he said if there's a universal force of gravity 
that goes like gm1 m of 2 r squared, then I can predict that the velocity squared of planets will fall off as 1 over r. In fact, I can find the proportionality constant. I get that the velocity squared of planets goes as 1 over r times the strength of gravity times the mass of the sun. Now, this is, this was his equation. Unfortunately, no one knew the strength of gravity at the time, because gravity is the weakest force in nature, and Newton couldn't measure it. It wasn't for 100 years to after Newton that it was first measured by a guy named Cavendish. And um, I learned when I was at Harvard, I was a postdoc at the time, and, and I, I learned that it's very important when you're writing scientific papers to come up with a sexy title so your colleagues read it. So there's hundreds of papers, and they only read the ones with sexy titles. And, or at least it'll enhance the probability they'll read it. So I thought this was a recent discovery in the history of science until I went back and looked at Cavendish's paper. Cavendish, who measured the strength of gravity 100 years after Newton, could have called his paper On Measuring the Strength of Gravity, but he didn't. He called it Weighing the Earth. Much sexier. Why? Because he realized if he's the first person to measure the strength of gravity, well, we could measure the velocity of the moon around the Earth and its distance from the Earth. He was the first person that could determine the mass of the Earth. And he did that. Okay? And in fact, we can do that for the sun. What worked for the Earth, we can do for the sun. The way we weigh the sun is to take this curve and plot it against this formula that Newton gave us and fit it. And if, it has to be, if this curve has to be pushed up to fit the data, the mass of the sun is heavier. If it has to be pushed down, the mass of the sun is lighter. And by this way, we can measure the mass of the sun to one part in almost, well, one part in 100,000. We can't do better than that. Why? I'm enjoying asking questions. I don't normally get to do it. Until I, yeah, yes? Mm, interesting idea, but that's not right. Yeah? Well, it is, but its mass is changing so slowly on this scale that, that at the accuracy of one part in 100,000, you don't have to worry. The sun's mass does change because E equals mc squared, but it's only losing a few hundred billion tons every second. Okay, yeah? I didn't hear that. Well, that's true too, but it turns out that that doesn't get in the way because we can measure that distance. Yeah? Relativity, good idea, but no. It comes in at a factor of 100 lower than that. So you're overthinking the... Yeah? Because we can't measure the gravitational... Absolutely right. You get a gold star. <laughs> okay. The gravitational constant is the worst measured constant in nature because gravity is so damn weak. If you want to know how weak gravity is, I'll give you an example. I'm, I'm digressing, but what the heck, we have a lot of afternoon. Um, we don't, but I'll digress, because this is something that I learned from Richard Feynman, a, phys a well-known physicist about whom I wrote a book. Um, so if you want to find out how weak gravity is, um, take a friend up to the tall, top of one of the tall buildings in his campus and push them off. Well, don't do that. <laughs> or maybe not a friend. Okay, so it takes gravity, say, 50 meters to accelerate your friend to the ground. But it's electromagnetism that stops them in a fraction of an inch. They don't even make a dent in the concrete. Because the reason you don't go through materials is not because they're solid. They're mostly empty space. It's the electric forces of the electrons in my hand against the electrons of the atoms here, in large part, that stops me. So the entire Earth pulls you down to the ground. All of the gravity of the entire Earth pulls you down to the ground in 100 meters. And electromagnetism stops you in a fraction of an inch because it's almost 40 orders of magnitude stronger than gravity. So gravity is incredibly weak. So anyway, that's, that's, uh, that's an issue that will come up a little bit later. But we can measure the mass of the sun. It happens to be about 2 times 10 to the 30th kilograms. And any of you could do this by just plotting this curve and plugging in the numbers. And you could weigh the sun. Well, physics is, is like um, Hollywood. I spent a lot of time in Hollywood lately for various reasons. And, uh, and so in Hollywood, if it works, you copy it. And if it works again, you keep copying it. That's why there's Friday the 13th version 24, or whatever it is now. And my, my friend Johnny Depp is making a P Pirates of the Caribbean 4, I think, or four, yeah, right now here up in Queensland. So we copy it, and if it worked for the Earth and it worked for the Sun, then it can work for the galaxy. Our Earth and our Sun are moving around the galaxy in a roughly spherical orbit. On the, it takes 200 million years for the Earth and Sun to go around our galaxy. 
And we can measure that, but since we're on the edge of the galaxy, we can use this to measure the mass of our galaxy, the mass of all the stuff inside of our orbit. And by the way, here is a picture. That was, that, that, this one wasn't our galaxy. Why isn't this our galaxy? It's a simple question. Okay, yeah, we, we live in our galaxy. I just wanted to see if you're really, any of you are awake. Okay, this is the Andromeda galaxy, the nearest large galaxy to, to our own. But, if, but our, it looks just like ours, and we have, about 25 years ago, finally been able to take a picture of our galaxy from where we are, because most of our galaxy is invisible because it's obscured by dust. But if you go up outside the Earth with a microwave camera and take a picture of microwaves, which get through the galaxy, you can see it. So this is our galaxy seen in 1992, the first picture that was ever taken of our galaxy. It's a spiral galaxy. And so the Earth is going around it. And so here's, the, we can do the same, and I could assign this as a homework problem if there are homework here. The, 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 the velocity of the sun is about 220 kilometers per second around the galaxy. And we know its distance. It's about eight, something called eight kiloparsecs, or about you know, uh, 24,000 light years, or something like that, from the center of our galaxy. So just plugging in those two numbers, Boom, we can determine the mass of our galaxy inside of our orbit. We do that, we jump up and down because we determine by fitting that data to that point that the mass of our galaxy is 10 to the 11th solar masses, which is 100 billion suns, which is great because when we count the stars in our galaxy, we more or less get 100 billion. So everything works, but we want to do better. So let's measure, just like we did in, our, in, in, our, um, in the solar system, it, let's look for other objects that are further out. We're at the edge of our galaxy, so the velocity should fall off at the square root of distance from the center of our galaxy. So we look for other objects that are further away, and we do that, all hell breaks loose. We'd fail in undergraduate physics class for getting this kind of data if we were supposed to get this kind of data, maybe, unless you discovered something new. If we look at... At, at, uh, at globular clusters, car, uh, molecular clouds, and satellite galaxies, out to 10 times the distance from the center of the galaxy as we are, instead of the velocity falling off, it remains constant. But what does that mean? Remember, v squared equals gm over r. So if, if gm over r is constant, if r is 10 times bigger, then m must be 10 times bigger. And if this is true, it must mean there's 10 times more mass outside of, of where we are than inside. But none of it's shining. It means most of the mass of our galaxy is invisible. And in fact, it turns out to be the case. You should be suspicious of this, of course, because you should be suspicious of everything. But when we look at other galaxies and measure what's called the rotation curve, instead of falling off like it's supposed to, where the, this is the prediction you'd base based on where the, where the stars are, every one of these galaxies has what's called a flat rotation curve that doesn't fall off like Kepler told us it's supposed to and Newton told us it's supposed to. So there's two possibilities. Either gravity breaks down, but there's no reason to think it would on scales of galaxies, or there's 10 times more mass enclosing all the galaxies we see than you can see with the naked eye. Most of the mass in galaxies is invisible, it's dark, it doesn't shine, and therefore physicists, because we have such good linguistic capabilities, call that dark matter. And what we've learned over the last 40 years is that, in fact, this was one of the things that motivated me to go into cosmology, is most of the mass of our galaxy is dark matter. And in fact, there's so much of it that we are now, for other reasons, have really strong evidence that it can't be made. I mean, there's lots of ways to make dark matter. I could turn off the lights in this room. Most of you don't shine, except for maybe the American student if he spent time in Los Alamos or somewhere. But, or snowballs, or even planets don't generally shine. So there's lots of ways to hide matter when they turn the lights off. But it turns out we now know that there's about 10 times more matter than you account, can account for for all the protons and neutrons that are in the universe. We can determine the number of protons and neutrons in the universe using cosmology, and I'm happy to talk about that in the question period if you want. But we know that it just isn't enough. So we think this dark matter is some new type of elementary particle. But that makes it very exciting, because it means it's not just up there, going through the galaxy. It's in this room, going through you right now, as you nod off, especially the Chinese students who just arrived. Because this stuff doesn't interact with light, and therefore we think it interacts very weakly, and it goes right through the Earth without knowing we were there. But that means we can do experiments here on Earth to look for. We don't need to just use telescopes. And in fact, I'll show you an experiment. 
in just a second. But before we get there, there's this puzzle. We got 10 times as much matter. The rotation curves are flat. Do they continue to be flat forever? Because we can only measure the rotation curves out to a certain distance where we can stop seeing stuff. So this doesn't tell us how much mass there is in the universe. It tells us a lower limit on the amount of mass in the universe. If we want to measure, measure the total matter of the universe and therefore determine omega, and therefore in principle our future, we've got to measure the mass on larger scales. How can we do that? Well, we use gravity, but now a different kind of gravity. And, and I want to show you this as a little bit of history because, again, some of you will be di disappointed um, when you become when you write your first scientific paper, and for all I know, some of you already have. If you submit to, say, a journal like Science, which is a distinguished journal, you will get rejected and by some idiot who will tell you what you're doing wrong, and you'll write letters back, and you'll go back and forth, and maybe you'll get the letter published. But in 1936, science was a, the, the, the world was a kindler, gentler place, and a paper appeared called Lens-like Action of a Star by the Deviation of Light in the Gravitational Fields. Fancy name. And here's how it began. Here's how the paper began. Some time ago, R.W. Mandel paid me a visit and asked me to publish the results of a little calculation which I had made at his request. This note complies with his wish. Try that now and see if you get published. <laughs> Wouldn't happen. But back then, it was a kindler general time. This guy had credentials, too. His name was Albert Einstein. So <laughs> it was OK. Maybe they published it anyway. But what he'd done was a calculation that he thought was completely unimportant. He had shown, and what made him famous, was that mass curves space. And therefore, the sun will curve space around it, and light will bend around the sun. And of course, that was a discovery in 1919 of, of looking at the solar eclipse that confirmed general relativity that made him famous throughout the world. But he realized that, if, that it, it could do further. If you had enough mass right here, and had a source of light behind that mass, the light rays would come around and bend and converge and come back together. And so that object could act like a lens, like my glasses curve light so I can see some of you better at a distance. So matter can act like a gravitational lens. And it can form multiple images. So if, if the light from a single star goes around that way and around that way and comes back, you on Earth will see two images of that star. And he, he thought this was, but he knew gravity was so weak, he said this effect is so small, it's, it's irrelevant. And in fact, it's so relevant that he actually did the calculation in 1912 before. This is his calculation in 1936. This is the calculation on which his paper is based. But it turns out if you go back to his notebooks from 1912, he did exactly the same calculation. But he forgot about it. He thought it was un so unimportant. But Mr. Mandel asked him to publish it. And, and as he wrote the, the editor of the journal afterwards, let me thank you for your cooperation with the, little, with the little publication which Mr. Mandel squeezed out of me. It is of little value, but it makes the poor guy happy. <laughs> That's how science is done. Well, it turns out Einstein was wrong, as he often was, um, because it wasn't of little value. It allows us to weigh the universe. Because here is the very phenomenon that he said would never be observable. Because he didn't know about galaxies, or he didn't think about galaxies. Stars produce an effect that's too small, but galaxies have hundreds of billions of stars, and clusters of galaxies have billions of billions of stars. And so, in fact, here is a cluster of galaxies, a large cluster, and clusters are the largest bound objects in the universe. There may be 8 or 10 million light years across, and all galaxies are essentially part of a cluster. We're part of a cluster. So everything that could fall into anything will fall into a cluster. And if we can weigh clusters, therefore we can essentially weigh the universe. And here is gravitational lensing. All, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to see that aside from these yellow things are these weird blue things. These weird blue things are multiple images of a single galaxy. This galaxy, by the way, is about 5 billion light years away, this cluster. This galaxy here is about 10 billion light years away. 5 billion light years behind that cluster. But the light has been bent, and multiple images of that galaxy have been formed. In fact, you would probably wouldn't be able to see this galaxy, except it's been magnified by the curvature of space. So this is a, an explicit demonstration that space is curved. It's beautiful. But we can use it, because we can use general relativity and say, how much mass could there be in the system, and where is it distributed in order to produce that image? That's a complicated numerical problem. 
It's called a, a mathematical inversion. You have to start with the matter and work backwards to determine light rays and tracing and try and work backwards to, to, to recreate this image to find out where the mass is. It's a very complicated numerical problem, but it was doable starting about 20 years ago with computers. And Tony Tyson and his colleagues then at Bell Labs for this cluster did this. And here's, here's a picture of where the mass is in this system in order to produce the image you've seen. The spikes are where the galaxies are. Okay? But what you notice is there's a huge mountain of mass where the galaxies aren't. Much more, in fact, there's little mountains of mass around each galaxy. That's the dark matter. But this dark matter in clusters of galaxies is much more. There's 40 times as much mass in that image as you, as you can account for by the mass of all the galaxies. Dark matter. But this allows us to determine the total amount of mass in the universe and hopefully answer that holy grail, is there enough mass to make the universe contract? That, and that's why, as a physicist, particle physicist, I wanted to learn the nature of dark matter so that I could be the first one to answer this question. And in fact, the neat thing is, if this dark matter is out there, as I said to you, it's not just out there, it's in this room, we can actually build detectors to look for it. Because it's going right through us. And these are, here's a simple detector that we actually proposed about almost 30 years ago now. Uh, it's a silicon, a little boule of silicon, the same stuff that powers your computer. You just take it and cool it down to one one thousandth of a degree above absolute zero. Easy. Okay? You put in a deep mine. Why deep mine? Because we're being bombarded by cosmic rays every second right now. And so we want to get rid of them because the dark matter will go all the way through the earth. Put them in a deep mine. Most of the time the dark matter goes through this detector without doing anything. But every now and then one of the dark matter particles, we think, will bounce off a particle of normal matter, the nucleus of, an, uh, of silicon or germanium, and deposit a little energy, and it'll heat the whole thing up by one one-thousandth of a degree. So there are dark matter detectors around the world in deep mines right now looking for dark matter, some of them claiming to detect it and invariably wrong. But they're right now looking to detect that dark matter. And if they do, we'll know, in some sense, begin to know the identity of the dominant stuff in the universe. Because everything we can see, all the stars and galaxies, compared to the amount of dark matter, makes up less than 10% of all the mass in the universe. So we're beginning to be, as you can see, kind of irrelevant. Now, what's really kind of neat is that there's a race on, because we also think these dark matter particles might be detected in another place. We can either look for the ones that were created at the beginning of time, or we can make a little big bang in the laboratory here. Where can we do that? In Geneva, Switzerland, at the Large Hadron Collider. We can try and recreate the conditions of the universe when it was about a billionth of a second old and maybe produce those dark matter particles then. And so the Large Hadron Collider has just turned on again, as many of you probably know. And one of its chief goals right now is to try and produce the particles that may be the dark matter in the universe. So there's a race between these people trying to detect it, directly detect it and the people at CERN, and they're both hoping that they do it so they can win a Nobel Prize. And, um, and, or maybe no one will. Maybe we're wrong. But it's an exciting moment, so stay tuned. But it doesn't matter what it's made of. Right now we can determine how much of it is, and we can answer that final question, what's the future of the universe? What's omega? And here it is. Omega matter is 0.3, plus or minus some accuracy. Well, I'm, there are people fainting in the back of the room. They're so excited, I could see. What does that mean? Well, omega is less than 1 in matter. That means we live in an open universe. That means, in principle, the universe will expand forever, and then we solve the problem. We can go back and do other things. But there's a problem. Because this, even though it measures the mass around clusters of galaxies, it doesn't measure all the mass, because there could be stuff outside of clusters of galaxies. How can we measure the total mass of the universe? And the answer is, we can finally use general relativity in its best way. We can try and measure the geometry of the universe directly. And the last 10 years, we've been able to do that. A question. Yep? Uh, well, how does, the question was, how does dark matter interact with matter? We know, and the answer is we don't know, because we don't know what it is. But there are those of us who can kind of speculate on what it is, and, and, and the best speculation that is appropriate for this is particle, these things called supersymmetric particles. They're, they're based on particle physics. So we say, if they're really there, what's really amazing is if they're really there, and they've been proposed for reasons having to do with particle physics, not cosmology, we can work out the physics of the very early universe 
And we can say, you know what, enough of them would be created to make the dark matter. Just exactly the right number. It's very exciting. I remember when the 1980s when we worked that out. It was very exciting for some of us. And so, okay, but if that's true, then we can speculate on how strong its interaction is. And we can say, well, it would, if these particles are around the mass of the Higgs particle, they would have, they'd have a certain interaction rate. We might find them in a large atom crater. We might find them in a detector underground. And that's why we tell these experimentalists to build them. And they spend 25 years of their lives building them. And then we say, you know what? We think it interacts a factor 10 more weekly. You know, and then they have to spend another 100 years doing it. But that's why I'm not an experimentalist. Okay. But we, we, give it, we have a guesstimate. But the, end, the great thing about physics is it's, a, it's an observational, it's an experimental discipline. So the experimenters like to use what the theorists say as a ra rationale to get funding, but they never really believe it. And so what they do is they build the experiment and find out. So we're, they, these dark matter detection experiments are there, and they'll tell us what the answer is. They'll tell us the interaction rate. If they see something, we'll know the interaction rate, and we'll be able to know what kind of particle it is. Okay? That's a good question. Any other questions at this point? Okay, now we're switching gears. We're going to measure the geometry of the universe directly because Einstein told us that geometry determines everything, right? How would we do that? Well, here's a simpler question. How would you measure the curvature of the Earth if you couldn't go around it, you couldn't go to outside space to see it was curved? How would you do that? I'm not, you all look too tired to answer any more questions for the moment. Okay, the answer is draw a triangle. And then because you're all exceptionally talented students, you would tell me that the sum of the angles of a triangle is 180 degrees. I could ask that of an American high school audience and I'd be waiting forever. But, um, okay. But the problem is you all learn geometry from Euclid. And that's true in a flat plane, but if I draw, say, the surface of the Earth, I can draw in a curved surface something very different. I can take a triangle by going along the equator, making, I'm sorry, it's northern hemisphere centric, this picture. Uh, make a right angle, go to the North Pole, make another right angle, and go to the equator, and then I've got a triangle with three right angles. And three times 90 is 270, and 270 is not 180, so voila, if you could build a big enough triangle on the surface of the Earth, you could prove it was curved without ever going outside of it. Okay? So even if you lived in Kansas and you built a big enough triangle, you could compare the, the angles and find out. It turns out we can do the, exactly the same thing in three dimensions. We can look for a, we, if we could find a big enough triangle, we could measure the curvature of the universe directly. And we've been able to do that in about the last 15 years or so. Here's how. If this works. Okay, there's a, there's a picture of something called the cosmic microwave background. If we try and look out at the universe, we look at those galaxies I showed you in that image, we look out as far as we can see, but it turns out with light, you can't see past a per certain point. Just like if I'm in this room, I can't see past the walls of the room. Why? Because the walls are opaque. Well, if I'm looking out at the universe, I'm looking back at earlier and earlier times. And eventually, when the universe was only 300,000 years old, it was 3,000 degrees in temperature. At that temperature, neutral atoms didn't exist. Protons, the electrons around protons would be, be, be scattered by the radiation, and you'd have what's called a plasma. And a plasma is opaque to radiation. You can't see past it. So if we look out at the universe and with light, we get a wall. We can't see past that wall because before that point, the universe was opaque. This is a picture of that wall. Now, it, it's a surface located you know, almost 13.8 billion light years away in all directions. It doesn't look like a spherical surface, but that's because we projected it. It's just like if we want the surface of the Earth. Here's the, oh, actually, that's, that's, that's better. We're in Australia. Um, we would project the surface of the Earth that way. What we've done here is project the surface, the microwave background. The plane of our galaxy would be right in the center. We've removed all that, that noise. And here is an image of what that surface of the baby picture of the universe. We, that's as far back as we can see with light, as far back as we'll ever be able to see with light. Back to a time when the universe was 300,000 years old. Two Nobel Prizes over the years have been given for basically coming up with this. Because it's a baby picture of the universe. And what's interesting is, this is, what's the picture of? Well, the hot spots, and these, this is microwave radiation, an average temperature above three degrees above absolute zero. And the hot spots are one one thousandth of a degree hotter than the average, and the cold spots are one one thousandth of a degree colder than the average. Which tells you that really, the universe has exactly the same temperature everywhere to better than one part in 10,000. It's uniform everywhere.
But it also tells us it's not completely uniform. These are the primordial lumps that would later collapse to form stars and galaxies and planets and aliens and everything. These were lumps created at the beginning of time. And we would like to understand where they come from. And the answer is we think we may know. And even better still, we may be able to test this idea. We'll get to there. But the first thing about this picture is quite interesting is that, that makes us surprised is that the temperature is the same everywhere. Why? Well, it shouldn't be. Let me explain why. Here's the microwave background surface. We're looking at it from the Earth. And, and, uh, and, and, and before that, the universe was opaque and the radiation is coming to us. And it's back from a time when the universe was a few hundred thousand years old. But here is a distance on this picture of one degree. That's an important distance. Why? Because this is 300,000 light years at that time. Now, you have learned, presumably, that no information can travel faster than light. So if the universe is 300,000 years old, this is how far a light ray could travel across this surface at best. That means nothing over here could ever communicate to anything over there at the time that surface was created, right? Because it's much farther away than light can have traveled in 300,000 years. But if they can't have communicated, why are they the same temperature? That's been a puzzle that's been around since I was an undergraduate. Why is the universe so darn uniform? Puzzle. But, and we'll come back to that puzzle, but more interesting, this gives us a scale. This actually gives us a triangle, you see? Because, let me see if I can show you. Well, actually, I'll come back. This is one degree, but it's only one degree if the universe is flat. Because if the universe is flat, light rays travel in straight lines. Okay? And so 300,000 year um, distance on that surface is one degree. In, a, in an open universe, light rays bend outward as you go back in time. So a ruler that's 300,000 light years across will look smaller. It can maybe look like it's half a degree. In a closed universe, light rays bend inwards as you go back in time, so that same ruler will look bigger. So all we have to do is look for something that, that, that is 300,000 light years across and ask how big does it look. Well, how do you know to find something that's 300,000 light years across? Well, think about it. If no information can travel faster than light, if I have a lump of matter that's this big, it knows it's a lump and it starts to collapse due to gravity and do all those things, and heat up and all the rest. But if I have a lump that's this big, it doesn't even know it's a lump. Because gravity, which also travels at the speed of light, cannot have traveled across it. So I don't know if you, in all your countries, if you ever watched The Road Runner, it's a cartoon that used to be in the US, but it's like Wile E. Coyote. He runs off a cliff and he waits for a while before he realizes he's supposed to fall. That's the way it is with the lumps, these primordial lumps. If they're big enough, they won't start to collapse because they don't even know they're lumps because there hasn't been enough time for light to travel across them. The biggest lumps that can collapse are the ones that are this big across, 300,000 light years across. So we just want to take a picture of the early universe and ask how big are those lumps? Do they look like they're half a degree, one degree, two degrees across? And that allows us to measure the curvature of the universe directly. And that was first done by an experiment called the Boomerang Experiment, appropriate for a talk in Australia. It wasn't done in Australia, it was done in, in, at the South Pole and a uh, microwave background balloon, a telescope on a balloon, was sent around, uh, around the world, actually, which is easy to do in the South Pole. In the South Pole, you just do this. But it was done for McMurdo a little bit further away, and it came back to where it began after two weeks. It's called the Boomerang Experiment, and measured the microwave background in a small region of the sky. And what we can do is we can create universes on a computer and ask how big would a 300,000 year 300,000 light year across lump look in such a universe. Here's a closed universe, and here's how big those lumps should look. Well, they're bigger than these lumps. Here's an open universe, and it turns out the average lump size is this big, which is smaller than these lumps. But just like Goldilocks, if we live in a flat universe, it's just right. And we now know, over the last 10 years, we've measured it, that to an accuracy of better than 1%, we live in a flat universe. Well, 2% to be more accurate. We live in a flat universe. We finally solved the problem. Omega is exactly equal to 1. But if you've been awake, and I know it's one or two of you who've been awake, 
there's a problem. Because 10 or 15 minutes ago, I showed you that if you add up all the matter in the universe, omega is 0.3. There's only 30% of the mass in the universe necessary to make a flat universe. Where's the other 70% that's missing? It's not in dark matter. Where could it be? Well, if it isn't where galaxies are, it could be where galaxies aren't. What is where galaxies aren't? Anyone have an answer? What? Well, no, they're in galaxies, it turns out. Yeah? Well, that's right. That's the name we gave it, but that's right. Dark energy. But what really is, is nothing. There's nothing there. There's empty space. Yeah? Well, no. Hold that thought. Okay, it's a good question, but hold that thought. I need a little bit more. In fact, I'm going to answer it in a second right away, because if there's energy in empty space... Now, th this is crazy. Let me point this out. This is insane. What I'm suggesting is that there's energy where there's nothing. And most of the energy of the universe resides where there's nothing. That means if you take a region of space and get rid of all the particles and the radiation and everything, it still weighs something. So empty space weighs something. Now that's insane. But what would it do? Well, it turns out empty space is not so empty. And this is where we get back to that Ouroboros thing. Because when you put quantum mechanics and relativity together, empty space is really a boiling, bubbling brew of virtual particles popping in and out of existence in a time scale so short we can't see them. Now that sounds like counting angels on the head of a pin if you can't see them. You can't see them directly, but we can measure their effects indirectly. And this is a very important animation. It's an actual calculation. It was shown at the Nobel Prize ceremonies in 2004 by the people who were, um, produced the theory that allowed this calculation to be done. This is the space inside of a proton. You went to good high schools. What's a proton made of? Quarks. How many quarks? Three. Protons made of three quarks, right? You learned that in high school. Wrong! We lie. Not intentionally. A quarton is made of three quarks, but if you add up the mass of those three quarks, it's only less than 5% of the mass of a proton. Most of the mass of a proton comes from the virtual particles and fields that are popping in and out of existence in empty space. And we can actually have a theory now that allows us to calculate that for the first time, and we get the more or less right answer. But if virtual particles and fields can give energy to empty space inside of a proton, we can do the same calculation and ask how much could virtual particles and fields give to the energy of the universe? Could they give energy to empty space? We do that calculation and we come up with the worst prediction in all of physics. We come up with the energy of empty space is roughly a gazillion times the energy of everything we see. 120 orders of magnitude bigger than the energy of everything we see. That is undoubtedly the worst prediction in all of physics. Because if the energy of empty space was much bigger than the energy of everything we see, we wouldn't be here. So this was a real problem. This problem existed when I was a graduate student, and before it's called the cosmological constant problem. But we physicists had an answer. We always have an answer, theoretical physicists. We're just not often right. The answer was the number zero. That somehow, due to some symmetry we didn't understand, all the contributions would cancel exactly. Why? Well, because we don't know any way to cancel a number that's a, that big and leave a non-zero something left over in the 121st decimal place. No one knows how to do that. But we know, using mathematics and symmetries, how to cancel things exactly. So the assumption was there's just some new symmetry of nature that cancels things exactly. It's zero. Everything's sensible. The energy of empty space is precisely zero. And that's how we could go to bed at night. And we, many of us were searching for that symmetry that unknown symmetry that solved the problem. But physics is an experimental science, even cosmology. And the answer is, if you want to find out the energy of empty space, go out and measure it. How can you measure it? Well, if you put energy in empty space, it's gravitationally repulsive, not attractive. You know, you've all learned that gravity sucks. That's what you learned in high school. But in fact, it can blow as well. Because if you put energy in empty space, it's gravitationally repulsive. So if we try and measure the expansion rate of the universe like Mr. Hubble did, and we try and look further and further out, if the universe was dominated by the energy of empty space, it would actually be speeding up, not slowing down, to begin to answer your question. So in 1998, 
two groups of astronomers who, again, didn't know more or less what they were doing at the time. They were trying to measure the rate at which the universe was slowing down. The same people who had developed this Hubble plot wanted to extend it out further out. And two groups did that and discovered something remarkable. This is the data from 1998-1999. So this is the Hubble plot that you saw earlier, but now this is extended out to further distances. And it's hard to see. So what I've done is taken a straight line and draw through that data set and made, and made it horizontal. So that line there is this line here. If the universe had been slowing down, like everyone thought, or almost everyone thought, these supernovae at very far distances would have followed this curve. But they don't. In fact, they don't even follow in the straight line. They go above the straight line. Now, there's only two ways to explain that. Either the data is wrong, which it usually is, okay, so we should be skeptical, although now it's been tested, or the expansion of the universe is speeding up. Now, just for fun, let's try and fit that and say how much energy would we have to add to empty space to fit that data? We get exactly what we're missing. If we put 70% of the energy of a flat universe in empty space, everything works. And that's the cockamamie universe we live in. A universe dominated by the energy of empty space, in which 70% of the energy of the universe resides in nothing, almost 30% in dark matter, and we are a little bit of cosmic pollution. You could get rid of us and everything we see, and the universe would be identical to what it is. We are a 1% admixture of stuff in a universe of dark matter and dark energy. So, one of the important lessons of this first lecture of the summer school is you are far more insignificant than you ever imagined. Okay, we just live in a random galaxy in the middle of nowhere and they're dominated by dark matter, but in fact, so much for a universe made for us. We are insignificant bystanders in a universe that's largely dark matter and dark energy. And this was such an important observation that it won the Nobel Prize in 2011, as many of you Australians know, because one of the people who led these two collaborations, my friend Brian Schmidt, um, who uh, uh, is at Australian National University and was awarded the Nobel Prize along with Saul Permuter and another colleague, Adam Reese, in, in 2011, for an observation that convinced the world. There were theorists who actually had predicted this. I happen to have been one of them, but, um, uh, um, but no one believed us. So, and the Nobel Prizes go to the people who convinced the world, so I'm very happy that they were. But I was also happy to be right. Okay, good. But this, we can, we can pat ourselves on the back, except there's a problem. Remember I gave you that argument? The energy of empty space should be zero, or it should be 120 orders of magnitude bigger than what we see. No one can understand why it's this number. So, nothing is very important. The dominant energy in the empty universe resides in empty space. We have no idea why it's there. Existence is probably tied to the very nature of space and time and to the origin of our universe, and it's going to determine our future. Now, we have to one, and I've go, you guys are tired. It's only 12.30. I was going to go on for 15 more minutes, but I can stop here if you want. Let's have a vote. I don't really care. I, I, you want to hear some more? Yes. See, they're, they're trying to get a brownie points. Okay, good. Okay, good. Okay. Well... The question is, if empty space has a dominant energy in the universe, then this raises this question that I wrote a book about, called How Can You Get Something From Nothing? Because remember, and you all remember because you're great students, what does omega equal one mean? It means we live in a flat universe, and we now measure we live in a flat universe. What does that mean in terms of the total energy, gravitational energy of every object in the universe? What value is it? Zero. If you were going to create a universe from nothing, what would you make the total energy of every object in the universe? This suddenly opens the possibility that we can get a universe with 100 billion galaxies and 100 billion stars out of nothing. It doesn't violate any laws of physics because the total energy of the universe can be precisely zero once you allow gravity. But to make this happen, you have to require quantum mechanics. Now, remember I told you that we think we have an answer to this problem. How did the universe get so uniform in all directions? And the answer is, we think at very early times, when the universe was a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a second old, empty space got a lot of energy, a lot more than it has now, for a very short time. And in a period of a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a second, it expanded in volume by a factor of 10 to the 90th. It went from the size of a single atom to the size 
of a basketball in a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a second. We call that inflation. We have reasons from particle physics for we, to think that happened, and I, again, may talk about some of that later, maybe even tomorrow. But if that happened, you can see it answers the question of why is the universe the same in all directions? Because I showed you the universe at, at 300,000 years was far bigger than the distance light could have traveled in 300,000 light years. But if you trap, extrapolate back, if at very early times it increased in volume by 10 to the 90th, then it was once much smaller than we would have imagined otherwise. And the entire visible universe today could have been in a region in which light could have traveled across it, causing it to become homogenized in the same temperature. So if it was uniform then, and then it puffed up, that would explain why it would look the same in all directions. Plus, it turns out that quantum mechanics rules when the universe is very, very small. And as I showed you, there are quantum fluctuations inside of protons. If the whole universe was the size of a proton, there'd be quantum fluctuations in it. And when the universe pops up, they get frozen. And we can calculate that, and we find out that they would produce density fluctuations, changes in temperature, that look precisely the same as the changes in temperature and the little lumps we saw in the microwave background. So inflation could explain why the universe is the same everywhere, and it could also explain why quantum mechanics produces you. This is quantum, we often talk about macroscopic quantum mechanics, and some of the lectures at the school may be dealing with that, but this is macroscopic quantum mechanics in the extreme. If this is right, all of the lumps that make up all the galaxies, stars, planets, and people came from quantum fluctuations at the beginning of time. And we can calculate it and find out that that, in principle, is the right answer, if inflation happened. So this is a little, little movie of, the, of, of a history, brief history of time, with apologies to my friend Stephen Hawking. Okay, so we have a, a period of inflation uh, when the universe expands very fast. Then, you know, all that time before the universe is opaque, and then the universe gets older and we get stars forming and then galaxies, and when we look through at the far end, we saw the galaxies, but we, of course, if we want to look through to inflation, we've got this barrier between us and inflation, which is the causing microwave background. So this is the Hubble Space Pic Telescope picture. This is the microwave background. We want to look through to inflation. Okay, we can't because there's a barrier between us and inflation. So this is a nice idea, but physics isn't based on nice ideas. It's not storytelling. If it was storytelling, it'd be religion. Okay? It's based on things you can test. And so if inflation happened, we want to test it. And how can we test it? Well, we can't test it by looking back with light directly, but we can use something else. Here's inflation. Here's what the universe, here's the picture. So here's the expanding universe today. If inflation happened at very early times when the universe was 10 to the minus 35 second old, it had this huge period of expansion, a dramatic period of expansion. Okay? Now, how would that happen? This is how we think inflation happens. It's like a phase transition in, in a material. When water turns to ice, what happens? Well, in fact, if, if you're here, and it's not going to happen this week, I hope, but if you're in Sydney and it suddenly got very cold, very cold on a given day, and went below zero, you'd look on the streets and you'd still see water. It wouldn't all be ice because the water's getting sloshed around and the temperature's going, changing very fast. So the water would be water. And eventually it would turn to ice, black ice, and you've got to watch it when you're driving. Just like on a window pane, suddenly you see crystals of ice form. Okay? But the temperature can be much below zero. That's what's called a metastable state. When we have water in a metastable state, it's there for a second, and then it phase transition changes and it becomes ice. In physics, we have a picture like this in, a, in, a, in a materials. We say the energy of water, the energy density of the state of, of water when it's a liquid, the average amount of energy per part, per particle, if you wish, is here, and here's what it would be for ice at below temperature, but if it, if it happens quickly, this state can exist for a while in what's called a false, in, in, a, a metastable state. If it's, if it's actually the state of empty space, we call it a false vacuum. So as the universe is cooling down for the Big Bang, it can get stuck in a state where energy is stored in empty space. And then poof, like an ice crystal on a wall, it can suddenly there'd be a seed that caused that universe to leave that state, that energy to be released in a hot big bang, 
and everything continue. But if you think about that, that could explain, so while, it's, while the energy is stuck in this state, the universe is expanding very fast, and then boom, the, the phase transition completes, and then it only starts expanding as it does during the normal Big Bang. That's the picture. But it's an interesting picture because if you think about it, it says there's more than one universe. Because what's happening is, well, there are seeds, boom, just like a seed that causes an ice crystal to form. Here, a region of the universe leaves inflation and starts a big bang. But everywhere else, the universe hasn't left inflation. It's still expanding ever faster and faster and faster. And then, boom, over here, a universe, uh, a region of what was then the universe leaves inflation, and you get another big bang. And over here, you get another big bang. And over here, you get another big bang. But if space is expanding faster and faster and faster, it never completes. It goes on forever. And it predicts that there are, an, over an infinite amount of time, an infinite number of universes. Our universe is one that happened to drop out of inflation at a certain time. And what's even more interesting, or more depressing, depending upon your picture, Here's a picture of inflation in between. There, this is a region of the universe, of what was in the universe, that jumped out, of, out of, of inflation and got the hot big bang. Here's another region. But in each of these regions, the laws of physics can be different. It turns out you can leave inflation in different ways, and the way in which you leave it will determine the laws of physics in that universe. And in some universes, there'll be lots of galaxies. In some universes, there won't be any. And so it could be that the laws of physics are just an accident. Physics, God forbid, becomes an environmental science. It's just, there's nothing fundamental, if this is really true. You have a question? Yes, but you're saying that there's well, I'm saying there are multiple Big Bangs, if you want to think of it that way, if you think of leave, the period of leaving inflation as suddenly a hot Big Bang. And by the way, there are universes that expand forever. There are ones that may, may contract and collapse. So if this is the case, it's kind of depressing if you're a physicist like me because you say, well, I really grew up wanting to explain why the universe has to be the way it is. And now I find out most of the time it's different. And there's an argument, I'll answer your question in a second. In fact, one of the arguments for why it is the way it is is really depressing. It says the universe is the way it is because there are astronomers here to measure it. Because you think about it. If the laws of physics were different, then there might not be galaxies. But if there weren't galaxies, there wouldn't be stars. If there weren't stars, there wouldn't be planets. If there weren't planets, there wouldn't be astronomers. And if there wouldn't be astronomers, then we wouldn't go out and measure the universe the way it is. So it sounds like the universe was created for us, but if you wish, it's really a kind of cosmic natural selection. We would be amazed to find ourselves in a universe in which we couldn't live. That'd be fascinating. It'd be worth a book or two. But in fact, it just says, just like bees can see the color of flowers, not because they're designed to do so, but because if they couldn't, they couldn't reproduce. It could be that we are here asking these questions, and the, prop, the fundamental parameters of the universe, including the energy of empty space, which is so inexplicable, might just be an accident. And the only reason they are what they are is if they weren't, we wouldn't be here. And we, and we could only live in the one of a multiple and maybe an infinite number of universes which had those properties. It's crazy. You had a question. Yes. So, so the fact that the rules of our universe are the result of it's not before time began. Time has already begun. It's after t equals zero. It's a very short time after t equals zero. Go on. Well, the answer is we can't, but we, can op we understand the physical laws in our universe. So we can work out, and by the way, inflation happens after the Big Bang, and wh where, we, where quantum gravity isn't important, it turns out, or not that important. But, so we can, use, we can extrapolate it based on known laws of physics where we can measure the quantum fluctuations, and we can see what will happen during our period of inflation. So this, this doesn't require, um, this, all of these universes still have fundamental quantum mechanics still working. But it turns out, when you leave inflation, the forces that become relevant are different. So when you leave inflation, in some, universe, in some universes, electromagnetism doesn't exist. In other universes, electromagnetism exists. None of that depends for inflation to happen. And if, it, if electromagnetism doesn't exist, then you won't have stars, for example. So the forces that result are different. Okay? Now, this all sounds like metaphysics. It sounds like philosophy or theology or something. The, what I want to leave you with is the fact that you, and I mean you, might be able to measure the universe 
when it was a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a second old. We've come close now. We haven't gotten there. But the next generation will get there, and that's you. That this metaphysical speculation is actually testable, and it's only in the last year that this result has happened, and I wanted to bring you up to speed, because I find it incredibly exciting. I wrote my last book before this happened, and I talked about multiverses, and I talked about all this stuff, but it was just speculation. Now we might be able to measure it. So here's that picture, the microwave background. It's the last... It's as far back as we can see. How can we go back further? Well, I'm going to do this to hypnotize you. It's early on. What is this? Well, how can we see further? We can use a signal that interacts less strongly than light. Such a signal might be able to come all the way from the Big Bang and make it through that dense plasma and get to us. What is weaker than light? I've primed you for this. Gravity. Gravity is the weakest force in nature. Well, it turns out when I wave my hands, which I do all the time, Einstein tells me my mass is disturbing space. And when I move my hands, I'm disturbing space in a way that changes with time. And it turns out I produce something called a gravitational wave. Just like when I shake an electron, I produce an electromagnetic wave. When I wave my hands, I produce a disturbance in space called a gravitational wave, and it disturbs space. And this is what a gravitational wave would look like if it were coming outside the, this wall, outside the room, coming from the wall. The space in this room would be getting smaller in that direction, bigger in that direction, then smaller in that direction, bigger in that direction. And that's happening every second. This room is full of gravitational waves, full of them. But we can't see them. Why? Because gravity is so weak. When I wave my hands, I produce a gravitational wave that changes space by an insignificant amount. And it's very difficult to detect them, but we built... This is a three-dimensional version of that. It has no information, but it looks pretty. <laughs> this is the biggest gravitational wave detector in the world. Speaking of big. It's at, it, there are two of these. This is in the United States. It's called LIGO, the Laser Interferometric Gravitational Wave Observatory, I guess it stands for. But there's two of these. This is in Hanford, Washington. There's another one in Louisiana. And physicists here, in this university and other universities in Australia, are actually helping develop the physics that's used by these things because it's quite demanding. This is amazing, and I never believed it would be possible. Here's how we look for gravitational waves. So these are two tunnels that are three kilometers long. And what would happen if a gravitational wave came down from above? Well, it would, it would cause this tunnel to get a little shorter and that one to get a little longer. How can we measure that? We send laser beams from one end of the tunnel to the other and at the same time. And if, and if they're the same length, they come back at the same time. If one of the lengths changes, one of the beams comes back a little earlier than the other, measuring a change in distance. But if we take the most cataclysmic events we, can, we know of in our galaxy, like the collision of neutron stars, producing huge amounts of energy, we can calculate how big a gravitational wave signal it would produce, and it's daunting. This experiment has been designed to be able to tell a difference, a change in length of this tunnel, which is three kilometers long, by an amount equal to one one-hundredth the size of a proton. You're supposed to go, ooh. <laughs> that is an amazing bit of experimental physics. Uh, un pushing the limits of quantum technology to their extremes. But it's been done. Unfortunately, they haven't seen any gravitational waves. So, they're making a more, a more, a more sensitive one. And, and LIGO has been, I mean, the advanced LIGO, we're using new quantum uh, effects, which may be talked about at this meeting, which will allow us to tell basically one one-thousandth the size of a proton. And we're pretty certain when it can do that, we should start seeing events of stars colliding in our galaxy and learning about the formation of black holes. It's the new, it's the astronomy of the future, gravitational wave astronomy. It's the astronomy of your future. So you should begin to learn about it. It's the window on the universe that's going to take us where we've never been before. Okay, some more questions. This is good. We'll still stand in, in on time. Yeah? Yeah. Oh, geez, they're great questions. Good. Well, now we're getting hot. The questions are much more important than anything I talked about. The question was, if gravity is a wave, can it be described by a particle? And how could we manipulate it? The answer is, we think yes. In quantum mechanics, all waves are particles. Waves of electromagnetism are called particles called photons. These things would be called gravitons. And we think the fundamental quanta of gravitational waves are gravitons. Now, this is actually all quite relevant, 
Because uh, when I was in Singapore recently, who's from Singapore? Yeah, okay. I was in a meeting with a friend of mine, a very distinguished physicist named Freeman Dyson, who announced in his lecture, he's 90 years old, but he's still doing physics, that you couldn't do any experiment on Earth that would ever detect gravitons. So maybe they don't exist. Maybe gravity isn't a quantum theory. And he pointed, his, the argument was a really good one. He said, well, if it turns out in order to detect gravitons, you'd have to build a detector, and you can prove that the detector would collapse to form a black hole before you could do the experiment. Good argument. It was during that meeting that I realized that, in fact, there's a way out of it. And the way out of it is, is, is the experiment I'm going to show you. Because it turns out, while we can't build a detector, the universe is a remarkable detector. And while we may not see these, these gravitational waves from black holes, there's another source of gravitational waves, inflation. Because during this period of rapid expansion in the early history of the universe, incredible energy is moving in, at an incredible amount. And it turns out you can calculate that there'll be gravitational waves produced from that time. How? Exactly the same way as the density fluctuations are produced. Quantum fluctuations in the gravitational field will produce gravitational waves that'll get frozen in. So if we could detect gravitational waves from inflation, we would, show, we would know that gravity is a quantum theory. And my friend Frank Wilczek and I wrote that down, won a prize a year ago. Um, he was already won the Nobel Prize, so he didn't care about other prizes, but we won another prize. And, um, uh, and it turns out, if we could measure gravitational waves from inflation, we would know gravity is a quantum theory. I'm dying to get to the end here, but yes. How fast is gravitational waves? At the speed of light. Because we, because, in fact, it turns out, and I'm happy to go through some of this with you later, um, gravity is a 1 over r squared force law, just like electromagnetism. And the 1 over r squared force law comes in electromagnetism directly from the fact that the photon is massless. So for the same argument, in gravity, the graviton is massless. Long-range forces have massless fields. Of, and well, that'll become relevant tomorrow. Okay? Okay. So that was a detector to look for gravitational waves from, from, from black holes and stuff. This is a detector that a year ago claimed to discover gravitational waves from inflation. It's called the bicep detector. It's at the South Pole. Okay? It's actually a cosmic microwave background detector. Well, how does that detect gravitational waves? I'll tell you in a moment. But it's very daunting to do physics at the South Pole because the South Pole is pretty cold. But it's cold, not cold enough to build these detectors, so we have to send, in the summer in Antarctica, we have to send planes down with liquid, liquid helium for these detectors to make them work. And it's interesting. I didn't know when I was your age. It took, I was a lot older before I knew this. This is amazing to me. Maybe some of you know this. We've gone to the moon. Well, maybe that was faked. But we've, we've gone... We, we've, We've gone to the depths of the ocean. You cannot travel to the South Pole in the wintertime. Planes only fly in and out of the South Pole in the summertime. Okay? Now, this is one of my favorite pictures of the bicep experiment. It's the experiment taken at sunset. Now, think about that. Sunset happens once a year in the South Pole. When the sun goes down, it doesn't come back up for six months. Okay? So if you're taking this picture, you're stuck there. So that's why it was probably taken by a graduate student. Okay, <laughs> But this experiment was designed to look for gravitational waves from inflation. How? Well, <coughs> sorry. Rem remember during this incredibly intense period, that's when the gravitational waves are being generated due to quantum fluctuations. Now I'm going to show you a complicated picture. It was from a Scientific American article I wrote a few months ago, a year ago, I guess. And the only reason I'm showing it, it's, well, is I spent a lot of time with the artist trying to get her to get rid of all her mistakes, and so I really want to show it. But here is the picture that tells us where gravitational waves from inflation came from. So there are quantum fluctuations at early times that are causing gravitational waves that are oscillating, but then the universe pops up, and the gravitational waves get frozen. Why? Because their wavelength gets stretched out. And that means their period gets much lower. But if their period, if this happens when the universe is 10 to the minus 35 seconds old, then a gravitational wave with a period of, say, one second is going to not be oscillating. So the gravitational waves freeze. They get pushed out during inflation, and they freeze. The shortest wavelength gravitational waves come in to the horizon, as we call it, start to oscillate earlier. So you have some gravitational wave, say, <coughs> with a period of 10 to the minus 32 seconds. It starts to oscillate after inflation. But gravitational waves die out as they oscillate. Well, then some other wave with a longer wavelength comes in later, say one second. 
and it starts to oscillate out. And maybe another one with a period of one year comes in when the universe is one year old, starts to oscillate. But there's gravitational waves that have a period of 300,000 years. And they begin to oscillate when the microwave background is formed. And what would that do? Well, if I have an electron and it's sitting in a bath of radiation, the same temperature in all directions, it scatters radiation uniformly. But if a gravitational wave comes by, then what the wave will do is for the universe that that electron sees, the gravitational wave, if it's, a, if it's the size of the visible universe at the time, will cause the visible universe to be smaller in one direction and larger in another. But that means it'll be hotter in this direction and colder in that direction. And that means the radiation will be more intense in this direction and that direction, and the electron will scatter radiation with an intensity that depends upon which direction you're looking at. We call that polarization. Polarized radiation is electromagnetic radiation that's oscillating in one direction or the other, which is why you wear polarized sunglasses to stop seeing the glare from water. Because when light bounces off the water, it comes polarized, becomes polarized, and say it's oscillating in this direction, if you wear polarized glasses that only allow light to be oscillating in that direction, then it gets rid of the glare. So, okay? But this, this will produce a polarization signal in the microwave background. And that's what they were looking for. And this is, what, this is an example of what, a prediction of what you'd see. So this is the hot spots and cold spots. And here are random polarizations, just random polarizations of light if there's no gravitational waves. And this is what it would look like if you had gravitational waves exactly the same. It's really, really hard experiment to do. That's the point I want to make. But nevertheless, these experimentalists, being experimentalists, they were brave and fearless or dumb, depending upon how you do it. And they predicted that this is a signal of what gravitational waves would look like in this experiment, these snake-like polarizations, which are unique to gravitational waves, these sort of snake-like things. And on March 17th, I think a year ago, March, they produced this image. This was their observation. This was exactly what we had predicted. Exactly what we would predicted if inflation happened. And if this is true, this is the most important image, in my opinion, in the history of science. Because if this is true, not only is it the first measurement of gravitational waves, not only will it tell us that gravity is quantized, but it will allow us, this is an image coming to us from a time when the universe was a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a second old. This is an image from the beginning of time. This will allow us to test if inflation happened and test the properties of inflation. And if we can test the properties of inflation, we can see if in fact the potential for inflation would produce a phase transition that would happen many times in many different places. And even though we'll never be able to detect those other universes directly, it would give us direct evidence, indirect evidence if you wish, that our universe is not unique. This is remarkably important. It is the most important discovery. It would change our observational window. Until this wind image, we could see back to the time when the universe was 300,000 years old. But this comes from a time when the universe is a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a second old. It's increased our window of time by 10 to the 49th in a single experiment. It changes everything. And that's why it's so important if it's right. But it's probably not right. And here's the reason. Here's the, here's the signal that they look for. It turned out to have some feature. It doesn't matter what multiples are. It doesn't matter what these things are. The, the signal that they saw was this. This is a signal predicted from inflation. It has a certain feature on the sky. And these are the sources of noise that they expected you know, due to our galaxy, to dust and other things. <coughs> so they predicted that there's nothing that could produce a signal like this. Moreover, the shape of the signal is exactly what they expected from inflation. But then another experiment came along called the Planck satellite, which actually could measure dust in our galaxy in a way that was better than ever before. And they said, you know what? Here's this peak that they see there. That's what they claimed to be the signal. This is what dust on our galaxy produced, given the uncertainties. There's enough dust in our galaxy to produce dust could have polarized, po the dust can be polarized due to electric magnetic fields in the neighborhood of stars, and it could produce a signal of the same intensity as the signal seen by this experiment. The dust is much bigger than they thought before. Now this made things very uncertain. Did the dust cause it or, or is it from the beginning of time? Now the, the, the bicep people wanted it to be from the beginning of time because they wanted the Nobel Prize. These people wanted it to be dust because they wanted to discover the signal later and win the Nobel Prize. And there were, both groups wanted exactly the opposite thing. 
And what is so wonderful about this, in, as an example of how science is or should be done, is that these two groups who both wanted the opposite thing, what did they do? They didn't go and cut each other's heads off. Okay? They said, let's do an experiment together and see what the real answer is. And that's what's beautiful about science, is you want to prove yourself wrong as much as you want to prove yourself right, because you don't care about being right, you care about how the universe actually works. So this year, in February, these two experiments reported the results. They said, first it found, we found, this is the, the, the Planck satellite, found that the level of dust centered on the bicep region is of the same magnitude as the reported excess, but the uncertainties are large. So they said it did a joint analysis, and here's the results of their joint analysis. Here's the new plot, and there's the old one. Now, what does that mean? Well, the old one said, we see a non-zero signal, these are called tensors, gravitational waves, that's non-zero to high, you know, high confidence level, and that's due to inflation. The new one, just so I can show you back, says, no. We actually still see a signal, but extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And you, we can calculate that the probability that that signal is not zero is only 92%. Now, if, if this was medicine or epidemiology, that would be enough to make a claim. But it's not, it's physics. And in physics, in this kind of physics, to make that kind of claim, we need an accuracy and an uncertainty, a, a likelihood of better than 99.9999%. And this is only 92%. This is an 8% of the universe's a, a spurious signal could give you what you see. And so, it's not as if the experiment is wrong, it's just not right. And we don't know the answer yet. We don't know if we've seen a signal from the beginning of time. We will need better experiments designed by smarter, younger people. And if we can do that, we will get a direct observation of the universe at the beginning of time. And so, this is how they quoted things, it basically says, this is expected by chance 8% of the time. So it's too low to be interpreted as a detection of primordial gravitational waves. Now there are other places we may get signals that will give us information. I'm going to talk about, in some sense, tomorrow, the other place we may get a signal, the Large Hadron Collider, and the physics that leads us to that, and to want to build that. But from that early image I gave you at the beginning of this excessively long lecture, of looking at the universe, we have been driven to these crises, to uh, having a universe dominated by empty space, the energy of empty space, we don't understand it. To not understanding of, 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 of the threshold of seeing gravitational waves and not knowing if they're real. We are full of crisitudes, and the opportunities are for you. So instead of being depressed by the fact that you are insignificant, which is what I told you, you should be energized and use your brains, and you all have big brains, I've been told. And I expect to enjoy your brief moment in the sun and build the next generation of experiments that solve these problems. Thank you very much.